So my name is David Trescott. I'm the CEO of Hybrick. Hybrick does cloud media encoding. So how many of you currently do encoding at all? Do you encode things? How many of you are doing encoding in the cloud right now? Okay, good. So what we're gonna do is show you how to do encoding in the cloud, how to do encoding in the cloud at scale, and how to do encoding in the cloud cheaply. Um, and of course, we're gonna entice you. Chocolate seems like kind of lame prize. I'm gonna give away an iPad mini. So, uh, just to keep your attention. That'll keep you here long enough. So we're gonna do it, we're only gonna give it away at the very end. So yeah, you do have to stay long enough. If you look around, your odds are pretty good. Uh, so, so what happens here is that I'm gonna start out with uh, 2,000 queued jobs. So I have a ton of queued jobs and I want to run those jobs faster. So right now I'm running on 100 machines in the cloud. So I'm gonna go over to machine configuration and say, all right, let's take this machine configuration and do we have an internet connection? Yes, okay. Let's take this machine configuration and bump that up. So right now, this machine configuration is set to run uh, 100 machines in US East on the spot market. Now 100 machines sounds expensive, right? So, I mean 100 machines, I gotta pay money for that. On AWS, you can take advantage of something called the spot market. And so in the spot market, basically Amazon takes the machines that they're not using uh, and sells them to you cheaply. You can bid on them. And so right now, the spot market is five cents an hour for a machine. So 100 machines is five bucks. So it goes from being like, oh my God, this is incredibly expensive to, it's a, it's a latte, right? It's not that expensive. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, let's bump that up to 200 machines. And we've also told it to do some things like set the max idle time for five minutes. So if we're not using a machine, go ahead and shut it down. Um, we've given it a tag, which tells us how to route jobs to particular machines. So let's say that you have um, data content that's sitting in Europe and content that's sitting in North America. Well, you don't wanna take the content that's in Europe and transcode it in North America. Why? Because you've gotta to pay to move that data, right? In the cloud, the things to remember is you pay to store data, you pay to process data, and you pay to move data. So moving data between clouds, between regions, is a bad idea. So you wanna leave the data where it is and transcode there. Now the important thing to remember here is that these machines, now when I talk about spinning up machines, where are these machines and who's paying for them? So these machines, right now you can see these are, uh, these are spot pending machines, which means we're out bidding on these machines for you. These machines are in your Amazon account. They're not in our Amazon account, they're in your Amazon account. You pay Amazon directly for these machines. All the management and all the software and all the failover and protection and everything else, that's what we run. So that's our problem. And then the cost of the machine, you actually pay directly to Amazon. Now, why is that important? Well, the cost of that machine then means that uh, from a pricing standpoint, we are um, by far, the cheapest possible cloud solution. So the dollars up there are showing you hours of source and the various cloud providers. And so that, keep in mind, that includes, that's, that's what you pay us and what you pay Amazon combined. And if you look at the, the green, purple, red, yellow, purple, we're, we're the line at the bottom. We're the blue line at the, at the bottom. So um, what we're doing is we have set the pricing in the market to about 20 times cheaper than any other cloud service. And by doing so, we've become the leading cloud provider. So companies like Sony, BBC Worldwide, Vivo, if you've ever watched a music video, that's us, right? They run a, we run a thousand machines for Vivo to transcode every music video coming in. Um, if you've been on Pluto TV, uh, Dolby, uh, Technicolor, et cetera. We provide these transcoding farms. And the transcoding farms, again, they run in the customer's account, not in our account. And what we're doing is managing the entire system to provide the most cost-effective way of doing encoding. So as these machines come online, they begin to run jobs for us. So we can look at our active jobs here and see what's actually going on. So all of these jobs are now being run. Now each of these jobs, just to give you an idea, uh, each of these jobs is a five minute uh, HD encode, um, and I've got 2,000 of them that I'm running. Now that's 10,000 minutes, if you're familiar with any of the pricing out there, 10,000 minutes at 
five cents a minute or two cents a minute, well, that's 20,000, uh, that's $200 to do that in code. We're gonna do it for six bucks. So it's, a, it's a, quite a price delta that we can do because we can throw a lot of horsepower at this. And what people don't realize is that I can get 1,000 machines on Amazon for 50 bucks an hour. It's just the, the cloud changes everything. And so it, it's, it's using the cloud at its true capability of scale. So I can, um, if I wanna see kind of everything that's going on, I can kind of see the entire network right now, what it's rendering for me. So this is going out now. Something to realize here is it's not just transcoding that's doing. We're, we're a workflow system. So we do transcoding, we do analysis, we do quality control, we do packaging for ABR, we do encryption, um, et cetera. So we do things like Dolby Vision, uh, HDR, we do all, all of the different components of this. Um, so how does a job get managed? Well, that's where it comes in. We actually use essentially a language to describe transcoding. So let's take a look at this guy. Let's take a look at a completed job. And this job right here, uh, this job is composed of different tasks. There's a transcode, analyze, quality check, copy, and a notify. So these are the steps of the workflow that I've asked it to do. And this gets defined by a JSON structure. JSON, what does it stand for? JavaScript object notation. It's a very, uh, it's a human readable, computer centric way of describing objects. So you might think of it as a, um, if you were describing a car, right, you'd have a car and then you'd have the make, the model, the color, the doors, the size, whatever. You could have all these different pieces of information. Well, that's all the JSON structure does is it defines these pieces of information. So I define uh, my source. I define, in this case, I've got a transcode task, which could be one in code or many. I've got a analysis task, which is saying analyze the data for all these different types of things, EBR 128, content variants, levels, et cetera. And then the analysis doesn't make a go, no go decision. The analysis just tells you, here's what we found. Then you can have a quality control check that says, all right, um, here are the limits, the boundaries of what I can do. As an example, Analyze can tell you that there's five seconds of black at the beginning of your video. QC tells you whether that passes or fails your quality control checks. And then we've got, uh, at the end of this, we have uh, a movement, a data movement. So we might be moving it into a Glacier archive. And then we have a notification on success and a notification on failure. And then uh, this connections array basically tells us how all these objects are linked together. What path do we go? Because you could go uh, source, analyze, transcode, 10 different layers of transcoding all running on different machines, assembling into a manifest, another analyze and quality check, right? So we could be doing analysis on the front and analysis on the output. So somebody like Avivo, that's exactly what they do. They have every file that comes in, the first thing they have to do is check and make sure it's okay, right? You don't wanna transcode crap. So you start and you analyze the stuff coming in to make sure it's good. Then you do the encoding, then you do the packaging, then you do the encryption, then you check it again, and then you send it out. So I'm also gonna do one other thing here in the machines. Let's grab another machine group and I'm just gonna fire up some other machines, do a different task for me. So while those are spinning up, so now what we've got is we've already burned through in the eight minutes we were talking so far, we've burned through 600 of the available jobs. So as we're doing this, we're gonna burn through all 2,000 jobs. We're gonna do it in about 15 minutes. Now keep in mind, we're, we're paying for those machines. How much did I said they were? They were five cents an hour per machine. But guess what? With Amazon per second billing, I only pay for what I use. If you only use those machines for eight minutes, you're only gonna pay for them for eight minutes. So uh, our 200 machines, well our 200 machines would cost us $10, but that's $10 for an hour. So we're actually, if we can get this done in 15 minutes, we're only paying 250, right? We're only paying 250 for 200 machines to solve 2000 HD encodes. So it, it, it changes the entire dynamic. The cloud, it's a different beast. It's a different mindset of what you can do out there. Other things that we have built in, so there's the ability to manage storage. So you've got your, uh, so for example, here is uh, videos that are up on there. These are Vivo videos that are up there. And you know the standard things of like, oh, how big is the video and stuff. But we can give you information about the 
Uh, for example, this is a 1920 by 1080 at 14.5 megabit uh, VBR audio. Um, information, remember this is on the cloud, but we can treat it like it's local content. So one of the issues about being in the cloud is like, oh, how do I play this video? Well, we can play it out of the cloud. We can analyze it out of the cloud. So our customers are moving to cloud-first workflows, right? Rather, where they're saying, look, um, let's just do everything in the cloud. If we, every, time, every time someone brings an asset local, that asset costs money because generally there's a human being sitting there trying to futz with it and do things with it. So everyone's trying to do cloud first, move it into, make sure the data is going directly into the cloud, processing's in the cloud, delivery's in the cloud, storage's in the cloud, archive is in the cloud, backup is in the cloud. Everything is being managed out of the cloud as a cloud first approach. We can also do, do deeper media analysis. So let's take something like this. I might want to look at this and say, okay, uh, what are the audio levels? What are the EBUR 128? Because now we're, you know, we want all of our, like with Vivo, um, when we first came to them, we were able to show them that all of their audio was all over the map. You would be watching one video and be, the volume would be here, and the next video would be down here, and then be up here and down here. So now, if you go there, you'll find that all the videos sound about the same. All the audio levels have been normalized. That's 50,000 music videos that we've gone through and normalized the audio on. Um, Finding out whether, well, they said it was progressive, but is it actually progressive video? Um, uh, video levels, blockiness, content variants, uh, bit rates, et cetera, can all be analyzed. You can even analyze things like, the big question with a video in compression is, is this video good enough? How do you know, right? Typically, it used to be, well, I had to have someone watch it. But if I've got 50,000 music videos, and they're going out to nine different devices, how do I have somebody watch all of that? Right? And not only that, nine different devices at eight different bit rates per device. Right? So I've actually got potentially up to 100 encodes for every single uh, source content. I just I can't do it. I can never watch the video. So what, we're, what people are starting to use is programmatic ways of analyzing uh, quality. So one of those. Uh, you might have heard of SSIM, PSNR, or Netflix VMAF. So VMAF is Video Multimode Assessment Fusion. Uh, we now support that, so we can actually do uh, computerized analysis of quality. Right? We know what the source was, we know what the output is, how good is it? And this is based on calibration of thousands of people watching videos and thousands of videos from Netflix being uh, basically categorized of how good they were. And so what happens is here is we can say, well, this one megabit version doesn't work because it's uh, got a VMAF of in the 50s, uh, two megabit, three megabit, three megabit, we can say, okay, now we're in the 90s. That's actually, you know, we can set our bar and say, look, it's gotta be above 90 for us to use. And then we can actually take a look at that video and say, okay, this is what we can actually put up on the Vivo website because it meets the, it needs to be louder. Um, so this is something where we can say, the reason this is important is because Vivo was, broad, was sending this out at four and a half megabit because they just had a fixed ladder. Now they can have an adjustable ladder that changes the bit rate based on what's happening. So they can change the bit rate based on the quality level that they're targeting. Why is that important? Well, if 50 million people are gonna watch that video, if I'm sending it out at four and a half megabit or three megabit, that's a huge difference, right? That's, that's, that's $50,000 worth of bandwidth that I'm getting ready to change. Just keep in mind, you pay for the bandwidth. So optimizations in the bandwidth can be very important. So I can go through and, for example, every time uh, Vivo tweaks their settings, they go through and re-encode 50,000 videos because the cost of the encoding is cheap compared to the cost of the transmission. Bandwidth is what they're gonna pay for. So now, um, next thing I want to do is uh, also on the tasks, uh, as tasks are completed, you can kind of see on any particular task, you can get the data on that task and see, okay, just you know, show me the analysis results. And all of this data comes back through the API. Most of our customers actually control us through the API. So there's uh, some kind of you know, system that sits above us that's just telling us what to do and sends us thousands of jobs and stuff. So, um, we're, we're a component of the overall process. Next thing I wanna do is grab something here. Let's grab a uh, new job. I'm gonna submit a job here. And we'll call this one uh, temporal split. Now what this one does, if we just look at what the 
JSON of this one does. Let's open up the temporal split and we'll see what that looks like. So this one, uh, it's just a transcode. In this case, we're doing a 1080p uh, transcode at a high res, uh, this is gonna be at a six megabit high quality and we wanna do this um, segmented rendering. We're telling it to do it in 180 seg second segments. So what does that mean? 180 seconds, that's three minutes. Uh, feature film, two hours long, three minutes, that's 100, that's 40 different segments. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, take this movie and you work on this three minute, 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 you, and, and I'm splitting it up to all of you and letting you all work on it simultaneously and then collecting all the results back and assembling it into a finished piece. So what that looks like is something like this. This is the movie uh, Rock of Ages, currently being encoded on 40 different machines. So if you're ADD, you can actually watch the entire movie simultaneously. Um, so this is the opening credits on the bus, is the bar scene, this is the scene where they're in the, politi the, the political rally, et cetera. And so um, this is uh, 40, so this is a feature film being done, total encoding time, five minutes, by smearing it across 40 machines. Now, again, uh, 40 machines, wait, that sounds expensive, but remember that you know, my 40 machines at five cents an hour, right, that's $2 but it's gonna do it in five minutes. So it's actually doing it in one twelfth of an hour. So anyone off the top of their head do one twelfth of $2? Anyone, anyone? Bonus prize, no? Okay, so uh, what? 16 cents, so we have a winner. Um, you don't need an iPad mini because you can do it in your head. Um, so, six, so really this is saying, you know, this is changing. I mean, these are things where literally, uh, the, Service bureaus charge 50 to $100 to do this encode, right? And we can drop the price to 15, 20 cents. So there's a, this is a, a big impact on what is out there and what's possible. And we track all the CPU performance. So we can tell you down here, I follow the shadow, we can um, tell you which machine group is using how much of its CPU. And then when we're done, we'll shut those machines off, right? So you're not paying for the machines if they're not actually doing anything. So the machines, you don't, no machines get launched until you have work to do. When work shows up, we look at what machines are configured and we launch machines according to where you've told us. Those machines launch, they process the available work. We break things down so a job doesn't execute on one machine. A job is made up of tasks. Tasks execute on one machine. So we take a single job, the job might be broken into 40 tasks, the 40 tasks get allocated to 40 available machines. Suddenly machine number 27 gets up and walks out of the room. We don't care, we route the, what he was working on, we route to machine 53, and it all automatically heals itself. So this is all done as a fault tolerant mesh, and so uh, a thousand jobs might have 50,000 tasks, those 50,000 tasks get smeared out over the available machines. Our price structure is based on um, total number of machines you wanna run in your network. So uh, we do it kind of in units of 10. So uh, 10 units, 10 machines is $1,000 a month. Uh, 100 machines is $5,000 a month. 1,000 machines is $10,000 a month. So that's a, a flat fee. There's no per minute per gigabyte charge. And um, you know, 10 machines, you can run pretty much you know, any kind of standard uh, you know, under a thousand hours kind of a month uh, process. And then, like I said, we go up to the largest media companies in the world. So we can handle scale, you know, we can handle Facebook scale. So um, kind of an interesting, interesting thing. We're a, we're a niche company doing a very niche thing of like how do you do transcoding cost effectively in the cloud at very large scale. Um, and we're finishing up, we've got 700 Q jobs, so we're gonna, are we gonna make it within our, we have three minutes. Within three minutes, we should finish off these jobs. Uh, I'm gonna take this opportunity now to start answering questions. All right, uh, we have a question up front. Hold on, I'll bring the microphone over. Got time for a couple. Thank you, Stavros. So, it's incredible how you're leveraging the spot market for great cost. 
Do you, do you, is there ever any blockage and do you have to then bid higher? So, great question on the spot market. So, his question was, what happens with the spot market? What happens if it goes up? So, let's take a look at the machine market here. So, I'm going to look at our configuration, and let's take a look at what the spot market is actually doing, because it's true. The spot market can change price over time. So, we're using standardized compute resources. So Amazon breaks up their, they have standard computers, they have GPU-based computers, they have uh, um, uh, FPGA-based computers, they have computers dedicated to high uh, database transactions. So there are different categories of computers. We run on standard CPU-based uh, computers. Well, the advantage is, is that what does Amazon have the most of? Standard CPU-based computers. So it turns out this, those, this line down here, the yellow line, is the on-demand price at 20 cents. All the region, these are the zones. A region is broken into zones, and the spot price in each zone can be different. So all the zones have been perfectly flat at 5 cents. Now, let's take a look at something that might be different. Let's take a look at uh, G2. If we were GPU-based, let's see what the spot market looks like for the GPU market. Three, two, one. That's the spot market on the GP based. So yes, the spot market is constantly fluctuating in here, and in fact, sometimes even goes over the price of the uh, cost of the on-demand. How do we deal with this? Let's suppose that this was the market that we were dealing with. We could still use this spot market, because what we can do is we can actually say, you have two choices here. You can specify the exact amount. Like, let's say you, cheap bastard that you are, want to actually only pay six cents an hour ever. You will never pay more than six cents an hour for a machine. Okay, if at two o'clock this afternoon the price goes to six and a half cents, you'll stop transcoding. And two hours later when the price drops to six cents, you'll begin transcoding again. So you can specify exactly what you're willing to pay. Or what all our customers do realistically is they just click on on-demand failover. And what this says is that we'll follow the spot market up until the point it costs more than on demand, in which case we'll run on demand, and then we'll switch back to the spot market. So this just says, get me the machine as cheap as you can get me the machine at the current time. The reality is in the past two years, I've seen the spot market for C-based machines, standard CPU machines, uh, exceed the on demand market for four hours in two years. And so our customers, it's like their average savings off the on-demand price, 75 cents, 75%. So it's well worth it to them. Every one of our customers, it's interesting. We have customers who start out with, oh, we could never run on the spot market, to, yeah, give me some more of that spot market stuff. Because it's like, it just works. And it automatically recovers if there's ever a problem. And we actually look, because the, the regions are broken into availability zones, we actually look at the zones and we will um, smear your uh, machines across the available zones. So if you look at the spot market machines here, you'll see that uh, 1A, 1D, 1E, 1B, 1C, 1E. So we've actually launched your 200 machines. We've smeared them across all the zones. Just in case one zone goes crazy, you'll only lose those machines. We will relaunch machines over in a different zone to recover that. So, this, um, this automatic failover network is very important. Um, we can also do things where it's like, hey, you want to fail over, but you want to fail over to a completely different region. We have that. We're introducing um, live, uh, so live encoding. So we're going to be able to bring the same price benefit that we bring to VOD. We're going to bring to the live market because the live market's too expensive right now, in our opinion. So we're going to cut it by a factor of 10 um, or 20, depending on how we're feeling. We haven't quite figured it out. Um, but the, the idea is to, to make that so you can actually um, control that. So here on the CPU, you can see um, for this five and a half minute period, we were using one machine group at 100% and then dropped off and then these machines shut down. So this group, uh, these machines, we're at our 378 now. We're just finishing off at uh, in two minutes. I didn't quite time it correctly, so uh, I can take one more question. Uh, well, or maybe I can. if it's super, super fast, we're over time. <laughs> Please don't make it a hard one. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, Larry's my name. Um, so if I have ProRes files, 
you know, large files. Mm -hmm. What am I putting in an S3 bucket and then running it through? Exactly. There? All of this runs out of S3, the Amazon storage. So yes, we can uh, both we can uh, take in ProRes and we can actually encode to ProRes as well. Mm -hmm. So we can do both. And um, so our our focus is on you know if you if you run your entire operation on one computer in your room, we're not the right company for you. But if you're looking at scale and you're looking at the cloud, then we are the way, we're, in, we're a path to getting cost effective uh, processing in the cloud. So ProRes is a good example where, yep, you're gonna need a good, a fast pipe to get that data up. Um, but uh, our customers, you know, that's a, that's a, they're all doing, actually most of them use ProRes as their source, as, as their source files. Uh, Aspera of Signia, but in many cases they're just using S3 browser or something else. I mean, even e all the standard browsing tools are encrypted links up. So Aspera and Signia tend to get used for things like if I'm a Warner Brothers and I need to send uh, your service business a file, I will send it on Aspera because, or Signia because I know that, well, it's been approved by the MPAA and it's got all the certifications. Uh, if I'm running a local operation, I just need to move data to the cloud, I'm just gonna dump it in my S3 browser and let that go. Because that link is in fact encrypted as well. Okay, big round of applause for David. Great job, very informative discussion.